Tissue's response to injury. The phases of healing. The phases of tissue repair often overlap each other and can be hard to understand. The first phase is bleeding. It begins at the onset of injury, and the objective is to stop the bleeding. In this phase, the body activates its emergency repair system, the blood clotting system, and forms a dam to block the drainage. During this process, platelets come into contact with collagen, resulting in activation and aggregation. An enzyme called thrombin is at its center and initiates the formation of a fibrin mesh, which strengthens the platelet clumps into stable clots. Phase two is a defensive or inflammatory phase. This focuses on destroying bacteria and removing debris, essentially preparing the wound for the growth of new tissue. During phase two, a type of white blood cell called a neutrophil enters the wound to destroy bacteria and remove debris. These cells often reach their peak population between 24 and 48 hours after injury, reducing greatly in number after three days. As the white blood cells leave, specialized cells called macrophages arrive to continue clearing debris. These cells also secrete growth factors and proteins which attract immune system cells to the wound to facilitate tissue repair. This phase often lasts four to six days and is often associated with edema, arrhythmia or reddening of the skin, heat and pain. Phase three or the proliferative phase. Once the wound is cleaned out, the wound enters phase three where the focus is to fill and cover the wound. The proliferative phase features three distinct stages. One, filling the wound. Two, contraction of the wound margins and three, covering the wound or epithelialization. During the first stage, shiny, deep, red, granulated tissues fill the wound bed with connective tissue, and new blood cells are formed. During contraction, the wound margin contracts and pulls towards the center of the wound. And in the third stage, the epithelial cells arise from the wound bed and margins, and begin to migrate across the wound bed in a leapfrog fashion until the wound is covered with epithelium. The proliferation phase lasts anywhere from four to 24 days. Finally, we have phase four, the maturation phase. During the maturation phase, the new tissue slowly gains strength and flexibility. Collagen fibers reorganize and the tissue remodels and matures. There is an overall increase in tensile strength, although maximum strength is limited to about 80% of pre-injured strength. The maturation phase varies greatly from wound to wound, often lasting anywhere from 21 days to two years. The healing phase and process is remarkable and complex. In many cases, it works wonders. However, it is also susceptible to interruptions due to local and systemic factors, including moisture, infection, local maceration and age, nutritional status, body type, as well as other environmental factors. The most common symptoms we see with inflammation are redness or rubor, swelling or tumor or edema, local heat, also known as calor, pain and tenderness, known as dolor, and functional lysia, or loss of function. In phase one, the inflammatory response phase, the injury results in altered metabolism and liberation of various materials. The initial reaction occurs through leukocytes and phagocytes. The goals of these chemical mediators are to protect, localize, and decrease injurious agents and prepare the tissue for healing and repair. These chemical mediators are derived from invading organisms, damaged tissue, plasma enzyme systems, and white blood cells. Histamine is released from injured mast cells and results in vasodilation and increases cell permeability, resulting in swelling. Leukotrienes and prostaglandins impact the margination or the adherence along the cell walls. 
This increases the permeability for local fluid and protein passages, also known as diapedesis. This facilitates exudate formation and neutrophil entrance into the injured site. Cytokinins regulate leukocytes and attract phagocytes to the area. There is a vascular response to injury. Vasoconstriction and coagulation occur to seal blood vessels and then chemical mediators are then released. Vasoconstriction presses on the endothelial cell linings together which produces a local anemia. This is followed by a vasodilation five to 10 minutes later. Initially, this increases blood flow. Vasodilation decreases blood flow and increases blood viscosity, resulting in edema or swelling. The initial effusion of blood and plasma lasts for approximately 24 to 36 hours. Acute inflammatory reactions can be triggered by a variety of stimuli, including anything from infections, trauma, physical or chemical agents, tissue necrosis, foreign bodies, and immune reactions. The inflammatory process, the clot formation. This is a flowchart of the inflammatory response sequence. The steps are as follows. One, injury to the cell. Two chemical mediators are liberated, namely histamine, leukotrienes, prostaglandins, and cytokines. In the third stage, the vascular reaction where vasoconstriction leads to vasodilation, after which exudate creates stasis. In the fourth phase, platelets and leukocytes adhere to vascular walls. In the fifth phase, we have phagocytosis and eventually clot formation. The platelets adhere to the exposed collagen fibers, leading to the formation of a clot or a plug. Clots obstruct lymphatic fluid drainage and localize the injury response. These are required for the conversion of fibrogen to fibrin. This picture illustrates the initial injury and inflammatory response phase of the healing process. In A, we have a cut blood vessel that bleeds into the wound. The wound is on the epidermis and the bleeding continues deep into the dermis of the skin. In B, a blood clot forms and leukocytes clean the wound. Macrophages form in the bleeding area. In C, the blood vessels regrow and granulated tissue forms in the fibroblastic repair phase of the healing process. And finally, in D, the epithelium regenerates and connective tissue fibrosis occurs in the maturation remodeling phase of the healing process. Chronic inflammation. This occurs when the acute inflammatory response does not eliminate an injuring agent. The tissue is not restored to normal physiological states and involves the replacement of leukocytes with macrophages, lymphocytes, and plasma cells. As inflammation persists, necrosis and fibrosis prolong the healing process. Granulation and fibrotic tissue continues to develop within the highly vascular and loose connective tissue. The exact cause for a shift in acute inflammation to chronic inflammation is unknown. However, it is typically associated with overuse or overload with cumulative microtrauma to a particular structure. In phase two, the fibroblastic or repair phase, the proliferation phase occurs from day three to 21. During this phase, the development of new blood vessels or angiogenesis occurs. Scar formation occurs through two phases, resolution, which may indicate that there was little tissue damage and normal restoration of tissues, or through regeneration, which is the replacement of tissue by the same tissue. The fibrous tissue, or fibroplasia, also occurs and the generation of new epithelial cells, or re-epithelialization, occurs. Typically, individuals will complain of pain and tenderness that gradually subside during this period. Scar formation. Capillary buds form. There is a formation of a delicate connective tissue called granulated tissue. 
This consists of fibroblasts that synthesize extracellular matrices and develop collagen, elastin, ground substance, prostaglandins, and glycosaminoglycans. The tensile strength will increase with the proliferation of collagen. There are 16 different types of collagen found in the body. The body contains 80 to 90% of types 1, 2, and 3 collagen. In a normal sequence, there is minimal scarring for the patient. If there is persistent inflammation, we have an extended fibroplasia, and a scar is going to be more prominent. In phase 3, the maturation or remodeling phase. The maturation phase can last from a month to a few years. During this phase, we see a decrease in fibroblastic activity, a return to normal histochemical activity and remodeling of the tissue along the lines of the tensile force. We may also see the formation of scar tissue. Depending upon how the collagen fibers are laid down, the scar may be very noticeable or very minor depending upon the size, length, shape, and the location of the wound. The role of progressive mobilization. Initially, individuals must maintain some immobilization in order for initial healing to occur. As healing moves into the repair phase, controlled activity should be added. Our goal is to work towards regaining normal flexibility and strength. Protective bracing may be incorporated at this point in the rehabilitation. During the remodeling phase, aggressive range of motion and strength exercises should be incorporated. This helps to facilitate tissue remodeling and realignment. As a clinician, you must be aware of pain and other clinical signs, which can indicate that too much activity has occurred too soon. If that is the case, have your patient rest and then we start the process again. Some factors that may impede healing include the extent of injury, edema, hemorrhage, poor vascular supply, separation of tissues, muscle spasms, atrophy, corticosteroid use, keloid or hypertrophic scars, infection, climate, humidity, and oxygen tension, and the health, age, and nutrition of the patient. Soft tissue healing. There are four types of soft tissue. Epithelial tissue includes the skin and vessels and organ linings. Connective tissue include the tendons, ligaments, cartilage, fat, and blood. Muscle tissue includes skeletal, smooth, and cardiac muscle. And nerve tissue includes the brain, spinal cord, and nerves. Soft tissue adaptations. We have metaplasia, which is the transformation of tissue from one type to another that is not normal for that tissue. Dysplasia is an abnormal development of tissue. Hyperplasia, an excessive proliferation of normal cells in normal tissue arrangement. Atrophy, a decrease in the size of tissue due to cell death and reabsorption or decreased cell proliferation. And hypertrophy is the increase in tissue size without necessarily changing the number of cells. Connective tissue healing. Cartilage healing. Cartilage has a limited capacity to heal. There is little to no direct blood supply to most cartilage. Chondrocytes and the matrix disruption result in a variable healing. Articular cartilage that fails to clot and has no perichondrium heals very slowly. If an area involves subchondral bone, an enhanced blood supply or granulated tissue is present and healing typically proceeds normally. Ligament healing. This follows a similar healing course as other vascular tissues. Proper care will result in acute repair and remodeling phases in the same time required by other vascular tissues. The repair phase will involve randomly laying down collagen that as scar forms will mature and realign in reaction to stress and strain. Full healing of ligaments may require a 12-month recovery process. The factors that are affecting healing. 
surgical repaired ligaments tend to be stronger due to decrease in scar formation. With interarticular tears, synovial fluid will dilute the hematoma and prevent clotting and spontaneous healing. Exercised ligaments are typically stronger, which is why we typically suggest early controlled mobilization. Muscles must be strengthened to reinforce the joint. Increased tension will increase joint stability. And finally, tendon healing. The initial bleeding followed by proliferation of ground substances and fibroblasts occurs. Myoblastic cells form, which result in the regeneration of new myofibrils. Collagen will mature and orient along the lines of tensile forces. Healing could take six to eight weeks depending upon the muscle injured. Other tissue healing, skeletal muscle healing. The initial bleeding is followed by the proliferation of ground substances and fibroblasts. Collagen matures along the lines of tensile forces and healing can take anywhere from six to nine weeks. Nerve healing. Nerves cannot regenerate after injury. Regeneration may take place within a nerve fiber though. The proximity of the injury to the nerve cell make regeneration more difficult. For nerve cell regeneration, an optimal environment is necessary. The rate of healing occurs at three to four millimeters per day. An injured central nervous system nerve does not heal as quickly as the peripheral nerves do. Treatment approaches, some different ways to heal injuries. We can utilize drugs to help us heal. Antiprostaglandin agents are used to combat inflammation. These are most commonly found in over-the-counter medications called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents, also known as NSAIDs. Therapeutic modalities. Thermal agents can be utilized. The heat facilitates acute inflammation, and vice versa, cold is utilized to slow inflammation. Electrical modalities may also be used to treat inflammation. Ultrasound microwave and electrical stimulation are all examples of electrical modalities that may be utilized. Therapeutic exercises. The major aim of exercise is pain-free movement, full strength, power, and full extensibility of all associated muscles. Immobilization, while sometimes is necessary, can have a negative impact on an injury recovery. This may adversely result in biochemical changes to collagen, making mobilization difficult in the later stages of rehabilitation. Early mobilization, which is controlled, may enhance healing. Another option is a newer treatment called platelet-rich plasma, or PRP, injections. This treatment utilizes the patient's own platelets to promote the natural healing of musculoskeletal conditions. A small amount of the patient's own blood is drawn into a vial and a centrifuge is separating the blood into its various components. Plasma, platelets, and white blood cells and the red blood cells. Red blood cells are drained away. Platelets, white cells, and some plasma are centrifuged again to separate the platelet-rich plasma from the platelet-poor plasma. An anticoagulant is added to prevent platelet clotting. The PRP is then injected into and around the injured tissues. These concentrated platelets release bioactive proteins. They are a growth factor and signaling proteins that stimulate wound healing and tissue repair via stem cells. This increases the growth factor by as much as eight times. There is usually an increase in pain for five to 10 days following an injection. The number of injections depends upon the type of condition, the severity of the injury, and the age of the patient. This is a relatively new technique, and there are a few random controlled trials that study the effects and offer strong supportive evidence for the use of this treatment. Treatment itself is expensive and can cost around $1,000 per injection.
Bone healing. Bone healing is a little bit different and occurs in three phases. The acute inflammation lasts for approximately four days. During this phase, a hematoma forms, vasodilation and edema occur, and in the next phase, repair and regeneration, osteoclasts reabsorb the damaged bone tissue, osteoblasts build up new bone tissue, and a callus forms. During the maturation phase, some shape changes to the overall structure of bone and the integrity of the bone are forever changed. Acute fractures have five distinct stages, a hematoma formation, cellular proliferation, callus formation, ossification, and remodeling. A hematoma typically occurs within the medullary cavity and the surrounding tissue, which develop during the first 48 hours. The blood supply may be disrupted by clotting vessels and cellular debris. Osteoblasts fill the internal and external calluses to immobilize the site. Calluses are formed by bone fragments that bridge the fracture gap. Hard callus cells become well formed as osteoblasts lay down callus bone replacing the cartilage. Remodeling begins with the crystallization of the callus. The bone continually adapts to applied stresses, and a balance occurs between the osteoblast and osteoclast activity. The time required for healing is dependent upon various factors, including the severity and site of fracture, the age of the patient, and the extent of trauma, but typical time ranges from three to eight weeks. Pain categories. Pain is a major indicator of injury. Pain is an individual and subjective response, meaning no two patients will describe or respond to pain the exact same way, despite having the same injury. There are some different factors to consider. The pain source, what type of tissue is injured? Fast versus slow pain. Does it happen very quickly or is it slow to develop? Acute versus chronic. Did it happen as a result of a traumatic injury, acute, or did this happen over a period of time, chronic pain? And is it projected or referred? Projected pain may occur in a different spot than the actual injury, and referred pain travels to other areas. There are four sources of pain, cutaneous, deep somatic, visceral, and psychogenic. Cutaneous pain is sharp, bright, burning, and can have a fast or slow onset. Deep somatic pain originates in tendons, muscles, joints, the periosteum, and blood vessels. Visceral pain begins in the organs and is diffuse at first, but may later be localized. Psychogenic pain is felt by the individual, but is emotional rather than physical. Acute versus chronic. Acute pain lasts less than six months. Chronic pain typically lasts longer than six months. Chronic pain is classified by the International Association for the Study of Pain as pain that continues beyond the normal healing time. Referred pain. This is pain which occurs away from the actual site of injury or irritation and is known as referred pain. Referred pain may elicit motor and or sensory responses. There are three types of referred pain, myofascial, sclerotomic, and dermatotic. Myofascial pain appears as trigger points of small hyperirritable areas within muscle, resulting in a bombardment of the central nervous system. This is both from acute and chronic pain that can be associated with myofascial trigger points. Sclerotomic pain causes deep aching and poorly localized pain. It can be projected to multiple areas of the brain causing depression, anxiety, fear, or even anger. Dermatotic pain is typically sharp and localized and follows what are called dermatome pathways. Nociceptors are pain receptors, free nerve endings sensitive to extreme mechanical thermal, and chemical energy. They are located in the meninges, periosteum, skin, teeth, and even some organs. 
Pain information is transmitted to the spinal cord via myelinated C fibers and A delta fibers. Nociceptor stimulation results in the release of substance P. Pain assessment. Pain is best assessed with the patient's self-reported data. We utilize multi- and unidimensional questionnaires. The techniques for pain assessment include the use of a visual analog scale, which is a very popular tool. You have likely seen pain charts, the McGill Pain Questionnaire, which has over 70 classifications and descriptors of pain, an activity pain indicator profile, and a numeric rating scale, which is asking a patient to rate their pain from 0 to 10, with 0 being no pain, and a 10 needing to go straight to the hospital or call 911. In the treatment of pain, we often use modalities. You need to have a clear rationale for the use of different modalities. Modalities need to be utilized in conjunction with exercise. We can introduce thermal agents for pain control, utilize electrical modalities to reduce pain, acupuncture, electrical stimulation, and deep massage can be used to stimulate an endorphin release. Pharmacological agents can be taken orally or injected. These commonly use analgesics and anti-inflammatory properties. It is important to work with referring physicians or pharmacists to ensure that the patient is taking appropriate medications for their condition. Pain is not just physical, but psychological as well. Pain is often worse at night due to solitude and the absence of external distractions. Personality differences can also have an impact on the perception of pain. A number of theories relative to pain threshold and pain theories exist.